This program is made possible in part by the Essilor Vision Foundation. In the U.S., one in four children has an uncorrected vision problem. That can affect school performance and behavior. As a teacher, I urge you to have your child's eyes examined. And is also made possible by... Mr. Schreiber, do you really believe that poverty can be wiped out? Yes, I do. Uh, I disagree with those who feel that grinding poverty, the kind of poverty I mean is the kind of poverty where you have very bad medical care, very bad housing. Some Washington insiders called him a Boy Scout, an unabashed dreamer. His enthusiasm, his idealism were unadulterated. But beneath his buttery surface, wrote one reporter, was a second skin of steel. He was the best all around politician I've ever seen. Yet today, he's all but forgotten, overshadowed as an in-law of the nation's most powerful political family. There are too many Kennedys in public office right now. How do you personally answer that question? Well, I say my name is Shriver. <laughs> Robert Sergeant Shriver, from the summit of privilege and power, he dared America's youth to work among the poorest people in the world and live out their country's most revolutionary ideals. Letting their actions speak for their hearts and for their minds and for this country. There was the sense of something new was emerging and that whatever it was, the Peace Corps was in the vanguard. The Peace Corps became the symbol of American idealism abroad. But when Shriver was asked to fight poverty at home, his methods became a threat to politicians everywhere. For the first time in the history of this country, poor people actually have a place and a way in which to express themselves. He fed the attack dogs that went yapping incessantly after the establishment. He was the golden boy. And now all of a sudden, he's running into political resistance from every quarter. It doesn't smack well with me, and it's more or less rebellion you had down there. And I don't apologize to anybody, anywhere. All these criticism coming out, you're doomed to fail, you're too messianic. It was a time of hope and change, amid a decade of conflict and rage, war and rebellion. And from deep within the political establishment, Shriver launched a string of social inventions that shaped an era and allowed a generation to live out its ideals. Peace Corps, VISTA, legal services to the poor, Head Start. He's probably had an effect on more Americans and more people across the world than anyone who hasn't been a president or a world leader, and probably even more than some of them. You go around the campuses now, there's more anti-hunger groups on the campuses, more housing programs. You should start with where you are, right here in your campus. For Shriver, the Peace Corps, the war on poverty, and America were acts of the imagination. They were ways that we should see and therefore be in the world. Very bad housing, very bad education. That kind of poverty does not need to exist in the United States any longer. It can be wiped out. before the presidential election of 1960. I'm elected president. Sergeant Shriver was racing to get a message to John F. Kennedy, his brother-in-law, and the Democratic nominee for president. Civil rights leader Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had been arrested in Georgia for violating probation that stemmed from a simple traffic citation. The severity of his sentence, four months hard labor, aroused fears that he would be murdered in prison and set off an international outcry for his release. An appeal for help went out to the presidential candidates, yet both hesitated to intervene, gauging the political risk as too great. The Voting Rights Act was still five years away, and few blacks were allowed to vote in the segregated South. 
The candidates feared that a show of support for Dr. King would antagonize Southern white voters who were crucial to victory. Shriver felt his party should reach out to King. Shriver, as head of the Civil Rights Division, was tasked with trying to get out the black vote. This was important to him simply because, you know, as, as an electoral concern. But that's not what really drove him. What drove him was this underlying concern with achieving racial and social justice and eradicating what he felt was the, the sin of racism. Looking right at the camera here. Both Nixon and uh, Kennedy had, had a, a golden opportunity here to do something. Neither one had, and Shriver really wanted Kennedy to take uh, a stronger stand on, on civil rights. Shriver had worked with Dr. King on civil rights issues and was keenly aware of the brutality of white supremacy, especially in the South. As he sped to reach his brother-in-law, Shriver thought of Dr. King's wife, the terror she'd feel, not knowing what might happen to her husband in a rural Georgia prison. They came to the cell and they shined the light in his face and he said, King, get up, put on your clothes. And he didn't know where he was going. They handcuffed him and put chains around his legs and put a big dog with him and put him in the back of the car. And he had to ride that way for three, over 300 miles. Then he asked where he was going. They refused to talk to him. For all he knew, they were taking him out someplace to lynch him. When Shriver arrived at Kennedy's motel, he waited for campaign aides to leave. He didn't want a committee meeting to decide whether Kennedy should take the political risk of helping Mrs. King. So it was Shriver in a hotel room at O'Hare Airport in Chicago that said to John F. Kennedy, we need to do this because it's the right thing to do. Shriver told Kennedy, Negroes don't believe everything will change tomorrow, no matter who's elected, but they want to know whether you care. Shriver almost offhandedly convinced Kennedy, in fact, he needed to do this. And so Shriver dialed Coretta Scott King's number in the hotel room as Kennedy was packing his bag to go somewhere else on the campaign trail and uh, handed the receiver to John F. Kennedy. He said, This is Senator Kennedy. I'm, I'm calling because I'm concerned about you and your husband. And if there's anything that I can do to be helpful, I mean, please feel free to call on me. And I said, I'm sure there's something that you can do, so whatever you can do, I would appreciate it. The next day, an article about the call appeared in the New York Times. Bobby Kennedy, the candidate's brother and campaign manager, was furious. Well, as soon as Bobby heard, he called and said, you bomb throwers, and you tell Sergeant Shriver this, that you're, you're closed down. Your civil rights section has probably lost the election. Three Southern governors had said that if we supported Castro, Khrushchev, or Martin Luther King, we'll support Nixon. And you tell Sergeant Shriver that just get out of the way. I mean, it was, he was lividly, coldly angry. Shriver recalled, Bobby landed on me like a ton of bricks. But now that the call was public, Bobby Kennedy leaned hard on the sentencing judge. Dr. King was released. With the election just days away, campaign aides were making dire predictions about how many Southern white votes Kennedy would lose. But in Atlanta, another plot line was unfolding. Civil rights leaders were saying, it's time to take off our Nixon buttons. In the aftermath, the leaders of the civil rights movement became notified that Kennedy had placed this call. It was especially significant to Martin Luther King's father, who was a tremendously prominent pastor in Atlanta. And he said, if he had the courage to wipe the tears from my daughter-in-law's eyes in that telephone call, I'll take my suitcase full of votes up to give them to Senator Kennedy. I have a sack full of votes. And I think I'm going to take him up to Washington and put him at the feet of John F. Kennedy. Stayed very close throughout the evening. Kennedy well ahead. The odds have now shifted in favor of Vice President Nixon. Kennedy's lead down. The election was decided by one of the smallest margins in history. Closest election of this generation. Prior to 1960, large numbers of black voters, including Martin Luther King Jr., voted Republican. But now, 
a record black voter turnout for Kennedy made him a winner in five northern states he otherwise would have lost. Nixon wrote that it was one of the key reasons Kennedy won. A new era in American politics was beginning. It's clear that one of the things that happened when Kennedy called King was to make a gesture of compassion to an African-American man from a white leader. This gesture resonates so powerfully, precisely because it's the affirmation of a much larger principle, and the principle that animates a struggle for millions of people at this point in the United States. And in many ways, this is a signature of the ways in which Shriver understood the need for people in public service and in positions of public power to be motivated by something other than simply the exercise of that power for its own sake. Sergeant Shriver was always close to the heart of the action where American idealism, American activism were put into play by doing the work which he saw as practicing social justice. In many ways, he modeled it more compellingly than any American political figure of the middle and late 20th century. The catcher is the field general, thought Sarge. He's in the thick of every play. He calls the signals, commands a view of the infield, outfield, even most of the fans. The catching is punishing. Sarge loved it. Baseball shared time with religion and politics for Sarge, growing up in Westminster, Maryland. On summer afternoons, He'd come in from playing ball and change into his altar boy vestments to assist his godfather, the Archbishop of Baltimore, with the evening mass inside the family chapel at the Shriver Summer Retreat. Their home drew priests, nuns, and bishops into Sarge's childhood world, a world also filled with the talk of politics brought there by Sarge's mother, Hilda. Hilda Shriver was unusual for her day. A college graduate and independent thinker, she marched for women's suffrage, demanding her right to vote, and fought against prohibition, defending her right to drink. Hilda was such a forceful personality. When she married her husband, her husband was Republican, and he was not Catholic, he was Protestant. She converted him to uh, become a Democrat and to become a Catholic. I mean, this was the kind of personality that she had. And Shriver really took after his mother. I mean, she was this kind of sun and the moon uh, of, of his existence. She was upbeat, optimistic, but also deeply committed to political and social causes. For his part, Sarge's father, Robert, took his sons along when he did charitable work in the tenements of New York and Baltimore. He and Hilda shared a belief that their faith should speak to social problems. With friends, they founded the Catholic magazine Commonweal. What Commonweal and other Catholic movements represented in the 1920s was a kind of a theological Jeffersonian belief that all men and women are created equal and are equal in God's eyes. So as a young man, Sergeant Shriver, still in his teens, was a witness to this development of the evolution of a Catholic social justice movement in the United States. When Sarge turned 14, his interest in social justice became more personal. In 1929, his father sold the Shriver home and moved the family to New York to start up an investment firm. The move was ill-timed. Soon after they arrived, the stock market crashed. The Shrivers lost everything. Charity from relatives and Catholic friends enabled Sarge to attend Yale Yet he felt troubled as his parents scrambled for money to pay the rent. He wrote, My generation is tired of seeing the most honorable people we know, people like you and Dad, worn down by an inhuman and impossible struggle. Sarge's father never recovered from the despair of the Depression. He died of a heart attack in 1942. Sarge was unable to attend his father's funeral. 
He was on a battleship bound for the South Pacific. Shriver commanded a team of anti-aircraft gunners and fought in a number of harrowing naval battles. Burned into my retina, he told his biographer, is the screaming, flaming tails of fire, projectiles as long as a living room sofa hurtled across the deck. I'll never forget seeing the propellers of my own ship forced to slice through hundreds of helpless sailors thrashing in the waters below or slipping on the stairs, slick with the blood of my fellow shipmates. He said perhaps most indelible was picking up the body parts of shipmates. They were put in plastic bags, like bags of disposable vegetables. I thought to myself, why wasn't I in one of those bags? Shriver took away a very clear set of ideas from his experience of war. The experience of the suffering and, and death of war, it, it ended up deepening his tragic sense of the, of, the, of the nature of life. Having lived through the horror of it, he realized that we should do whatever we can at all costs to avoid it. The days following America's victory were heady ones. After being in combat, Shriver was bored with his new job as an attorney and then as an assistant editor at Newsweek. So he focused on his social life. At a party in 1946, he met Eunice Kennedy. I was dazzled, he recalled. Never had I met a woman so intelligent, so sure of herself. They married in 1953. 1,700 people attended their reception featuring an eight-tier wedding cake. Sarge knew he was entering a powerful family. But in the early 1950s, few could have predicted how powerful they would become. The Shrivers settled in Chicago, where Sarge was running the Kennedy-owned merchandise mart. Shriver became president of the Board of Education, and he led a Catholic civil rights organization that challenged Catholic hospitals and schools to desegregate. Chicago's news editors were touting Shriver for governor, but all bets were off when Eunice's father asked Sarge for help on his son Jack's presidential bid. It can't have been easy for a guy who, throughout the 1950s, had been building a very powerful political career, and many people were talking about him as being the next governor or senator from Illinois. And he marries into this, the uber-political family, the Kennedy family, and all of a sudden he has to take a back seat to all the aspirations of, of Jack and Bobby and Ted. Um, for a lot of people with political aspirations, that wouldn't have been something they could have done and survived. They would have become resentful or bitter. Uh, Shriver was able to both be a very loyal family member while at the same time retaining, for the most part, his own political identity as well. I'd gone back to uh, Chicago when the phone rang. It was the president on there, and uh, uh, he called a couple of times. And finally, my wife said, Sarge, you've got to talk to Jack now. Remember, he's the president. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> I said, uh, well, all right, I will. So about the third time I got on the phone, he said, um, listen, you've got to come down here to Washington to run the Peace Corps. And I said, well, Mr. President, you know, I don't know anything about any Peace Corps. And he said, well, that's all right, neither does anybody else. And I said, but yes, but remember all the political debts you incurred during the campaign. Why don't you give this uh, job to one of your political friends? <clears throat> he said, listen, Sarge, the truth of the matter is that everybody thinks the Peace Corps is going to be one of the greatest fiascos in history. If it turns out that way, it's much easier to fire a relative than a political friend. <laughs> Kennedy hadn't planned on a Peace Corps when students picked up on remarks he made during a campaign stop. How many of you who are going to be doctors are willing to spend your days in God? How many of you are willing His words lit the imagination of Michigan students. And to his surprise, he was presented with a petition signed by 800 students ready to volunteer. Overnight, 
a handful of students elicited a campaign pledge and inspired a new strategy in the Cold War. After centuries of colonial rule, the Cameroon celebrates its achievement of sovereignty. As new nations freed themselves from colonial rule, the United States and the Soviet Union competed for their loyalty. Kennedy thought the Peace Corps could help in a global fight against hunger and disease and enhance America's standing among developing nations. In a larger sense, the United States and the Soviet Union want to be aligned with these smaller countries in these other areas of the world. So it's partly about winning hearts and minds in the Cold War, but it really was also about unleashing this sort of youthful idealism and believing that um, American know-how could actually solve these problems. But hardened Washington insiders mocked the idea as Kennedy's children's crusade. They thought this was a naive kitty corps. If you want to take a trip of the moon, send the Peace Corps up there. I mean, these are hard-bitten politicians who have tough campaigns and who trade and wheedle and negotiate. And it might be a very good place to uh, try out this experiment, sort of a juvenile experiment. <laughs> the ridicule unnerved Kennedy. He wrote, it is very possible that it is a mistake that men and women as young as the immediate post-college age should be sent abroad. He didn't have illusions about the difficulties of getting a new program launched, particularly sending thousands of untrained, untested people around the world. If that one failed, uh, it would be a black eye for the administration and for the whole idea. Kennedy's aides counseled caution. They proposed a small Peace Corps, a pilot program, under the control of the Foreign Service. Shriver disagreed. Shriver thought it would be the death knell of the kind of Peace Corps he wanted. In Kennedy's mind was the notion of, you know, a couple of hundred young people might go out and, and do these things in the developing countries. I think Shriver had a much bolder, grander vision that to really make an impact, you had to scale this thing up. Because hunger and ignorance and disease exist in stark reality for billions of people. You know, as much as he understood that it's important for the West to defeat communism, he also had this deep and sincere conviction that this was about more than mere politics uh, and bigger than the Cold War itself. Shriver took his idea for the Peace Corps to the developing world, where most leaders greeted him with suspicion. Three weeks earlier, the United States had attempted an invasion of Cuba at the Bay of Pigs. Still, eight countries welcomed the Peace Corps. In Washington, though, Kennedy's aides still resisted. We heard, we knew, we saw the bureaucracy want to absorb the Peace Corps and make it over in its image. So what do we do? We went to the, to the man who understood the bureaucracy better than any other person in government. He had been known as the master of the Senate. Now he was vice president. Lyndon Johnson. Johnson liked Shriver and his vision for the Peace Corps and told him, let me talk to Kennedy. I would like to have been a fly on the wall for that discussion. I later learned that what he said in essence was, if you let the State Department run the Peace Corps, you will never I uh, know what it might have been, and whatever it does become won't be yours. If you want the Peace Corps to soar, you have to cut it loose from the bureaucracy. Kennedy said he would not stand in the way of Shriver's vision for the Peace Corps, but neither would he help push it through Congress. You, know, you guys were all so hell-bent on having the Peace Corps be an independent agency that you can get your own damn bill through Congress. That's the word we got, and he went with Moyers resolved to see every single member of the United States Congress personally. More Americans will have an intimate and personal awareness of the problems of the underdeveloped but aspiring countries whose future is so closely linked with our own. I've never seen anyone focus more intently on the member of Congress sitting right there, 
He did his homework, he had really good research, but he also just relied on looking that member of Congress right in the eye and saying, don't you believe in young people? Don't you believe in American idealism? Don't you believe that we've got a new mission in the world? Sure you do. If you were 25 years younger, you'd be signing up for this, he said. By the summer break, Shriver and Moyers had met with more than 500 legislators. Sarge at one point said, you know, I've seen every congressman but one. And um, it turned out that the one he hadn't seen was six months dead. So we, in fact, now have everybody lined up to introduce this measure on the floor and get it passed in the Senate. And Larry O'Brien, who was President Kennedy's congressional relations person, got wind of what we were doing. Get a call from Larry, what the hell are you guys doing over there? And our response to Larry was essentially, you told us we were on our own, and we are. The Peace Corps bill passed Congress. On August 29, 1961, America sent its first Peace Corps volunteers to the African nations of Ghana and Tanganyika. The press called them Kennedy's kids. But Kennedy called them Sarge's kids. We're looking for people who have empathy, who are able to live in a, in a foreign culture uh, without uh, uh, worrying about the fact they can't get a hamburger to eat or a thick shake or something like that or there's no automobile. Sometimes I've thought that there's some American tourists and businessmen and others who go overseas and almost have to have a special enclosure around them. They've got to have air piped in from Arizona, otherwise they can't stand it in Africa. I had the experience one time of an official abroad handing me a glove that I could wear so that when I shook hands with the natives, uh, that I wouldn't get contaminated. Well, that's the kind of thought we don't want in the Peace Corps. One observer wrote, few volunteers got a glimpse of glory. Six died and hundreds quit or were fired. Yet in just two years, the Peace Corps had more than 10,000 volunteers in 43 countries, piling up thousands of tiny triumphs. Health programs, agricultural development programs, education development programs. Let's talk for a few minutes about the characters in the book, because one of the most... There were very tangible aggregate results. It meant wells. It meant feeder roads. It meant libraries. It meant stores and whatnot. Small increments of development, but real things that you could put your hands on. It wasn't the poverty or the undevelopment side of it that came across to me. It was this ancient culture and these very lively people inside this culture. It's a raw and very extraordinary, challenging experience. And you just learn things you never would learn in a more structured approach. I've always felt that Shriver, coming from a very partitioned background, had an intuitive sense that ordinary young Americans, the people who came into the Peace Corps, were capable of doing great things. Whereas a lot of people don't think of young people in that sense. I mean, they want to put young people in very, you know, internships and very circumscribed roles. We were, for all practical purposes, you know, like in the diplomatic service. In the last few months, more applications for the Peace Corps have come to us than have come for positions in all the rest of the United States government put together. In the 50s, the key word was always conformity. All kinds of bestsellers came out and said, we're becoming a conformist society. There's no more independence. There's no more personal autonomy. There's no more sort of entrepreneurial can-do spirit. And the Kennedys and Shriver clearly picked up on that theme. And they said, no, here it is. We will galvanize and mobilize this kind of nascent or dormant spirit of idealism that's out there and just needs a leader, a cause, a movement. And of all of our ideals, none surpasses the importance of service. To convert our good words into good deeds. Our greatness depends upon it, not only practicing it here at home, but in the world at large. 
What he's trying to do is draw other people to that understanding and pull them into a community that is international and that is engaged in winning alignments soul to soul, person to person, heart to heart. Let's say 13,000 volunteers all over the world letting their actions speak letting their actions speak for their hearts and for their minds and for this country. Here comes this invitation through the Peace Corps to make a difference, to make a contribution, to do something, something of consequence. And this program appeared to convey to young people that they could be of consequence in a way that would help people around them and in a way that ultimately would help themselves. They've done a great job. They've gone into places where it was said, we couldn't, we shouldn't even try to go. For example, Latin American universities. You've heard all those things in the newspapers. It's almost like a cliche. Latin American universities are always modified by either before or after by saying hotbed of communism or maybe alternatively cesspool of Marxism. <laughs> <coughs> and it was, it was ridiculous to let you go there. I mean, you obviously are not intellectually strong enough to go there. Uh, how could you possibly compete with a, was, the other fellow was always a trained communist <laughs> operator. And you were a kid. Well, I think, I'm not sure of these statistics, but I would estimate we have 100 American Peace Corps volunteers teaching in South American universities right now. They're in universities, the very place where they spit on, on Nixon. We've got uh, Peace Corps volunteers. <laughs> Time magazine called the Peace Corps the U.S. ideal abroad, and Traver boasted he changed the slogan Yankee Go Home to send us more volunteers. In every way that he could, he tried to set the example. The way we traveled, the places that he would go, the things that he would do, and uh, we traveled like the Peace Corps. We were always in tourist seats. I mean, here's the brother-in-law of the President of the United States. He rated first class. We were not only in tourist seats, he used to sleep on the floor of the uh, of the plane literally how do you do it how do you what? get how do you get under a seat on an airplane that's well, impossible well it's not really impossible at all most of those airplane seats are maybe anywhere from 10 to 12 inches off the floor there's plenty of room and you can stretch out your head goes under the seat in front of you and your feet go behind and there's just about a six foot spread there Whoa. and uh, it's very comfortable it is more comfortable than the peace corps was really an extension of shriver of his charisma and his worldview and it was also an extension of his highly demanding nature. He wanted people to have fun, but he also wanted people to be completely devoted to this cause. People say, you know, did Shriver have weaknesses? And a lot of ways, his weaknesses were the same as his strengths. One guy was quoted as saying, you know, he's so in tune with improving the lot of mankind that he's sort of blind to the predicament of the man standing next to him. You know, there, there was this quality that, you know, I think he's read about in a lot of saints where they, they are so driven by these this larger purpose that they sometimes politeness and small scale human suffering gets ignored he was impossible sometimes he didn't do the touchy feely thing he was mercurial he was a demanding he was all the things you know he was no saint mr driver you're rather big on signs and slogans are you really as tough as these slogans impute well i don't know that i am he was very tough. He was very tough. And there was a lot of turnover because people could not take the pressure. Some people. And some of the fellows on the Peace Corps staff bought this bull whip, and they said it was symbolic of the way I was treating them at headquarters, whipping them with this big bull whip. It doesn't look very used. Well, it's not, obviously. It was too good to use. And, you had to be uh, in to love to with the Peace Corps. The since the early days of the Peace Corps. You really did. Now it goes with you. Now it goes with me. By 1963, Sarge and Eunice had three children, Bobby, Maria, and Timothy. Mark and Anthony were born soon after. They lived on a 23-acre estate called Timberlawn. Like a giant playground, it doubled as the Peace Corps weekend headquarters and Camp Shriver. 
Retarded children get a thrill usually reserved for the able-bodied at the Rockville, Maryland home of Mr. and Mrs. Sergeant Shriver. Eunice Shriver brought in busloads of children to Timberlawn for sports and fun. She believed it would help the mentally handicapped feel capable and part of the larger community. She rejected all of the assumptions that had governed the way people with mental retardation were viewed. And so she understood that people love to compete. They love to engage in competition with each other. And that became the basis for the Special Olympics program. The Special Olympics were born in her backyard. By the fall of 1963, Kennedy had submitted a civil rights bill to Congress, signed a nuclear test ban treaty, and begun to publicly speak about a post-Cold War vision of the world. He and Shriver talked about growing the Peace Corps to 100,000 volunteers within the next decade. And when we do, Kennedy said, there will be a million Americans with the experience of living in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And for the first time, we'll have the constituency for a good foreign policy. There was a sense of almost infinite possibilities that the world was so full of need and the response in this country was so great Whatever the new frontier was, the Peace Corps defined it. The Peace Corps was really giving the new frontier of John F. Kennedy a particular mission. What's ahead for the Peace Corps in the next five years or decade, Mr. Schreiber? Well, that's a big question. I'd like to know what's ahead in the next 90 days. Uh... From Dallas, Texas, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Two o'clock. When Shriver heard the news, he went to the White House where he found a message from Jackie Kennedy asking him to arrange the funeral. For three days straight, Shriver slept but a few hours as he attended to a multitude of details. The scenes that we saw came more out of Shriver than anyone else, wrote one reporter. The family man and stepped behind Jacqueline Kennedy on her mournful march to her husband's funeral. The President of the United States. John Kennedy's death commands what his life conveyed. President Lyndon Johnson no pledged to carry out Kennedy's intentions to pass a civil rights bill and to help to the nation's press. poor. And America must move forward. He asked Kennedy's people to stay on, especially Shriver. Johnson told him, now I'm in a position to do something that reflects the high regard I have for you. He leaked to the press that Shriver was a top choice for vice president. Johnson really thought Shriver was a comer in national politics. He saw Sarge as a natural asset, and that was both uh, a positive in terms of bringing a Kennedy into the campaign. It was also a negative, because he knew that if he chose Sarge over Bobby, there would be conflicts within the family, jealousies within the family. Many of the Kennedy people felt that if anybody should be on the ticket, it was Bobby. That message was delivered to the White House and to Shriver, putting him in an awkward position. He told Bobby, the president, and reporters, I'm not running for anything. But Johnson kept Shriver's name in play and took months to make a decision. It was a real game going on in his head. He was really intrigued uh, about the prospects, and he was tempted. Uh, Johnson finally turned back from the, f the fear that there would be great opposition from within the family. And uh, the moment passed, but uh, there was a moment when Sarge was likely to become the vice president of the United States. The president concluded he wanted Shriver in another role, to run a war on poverty. I'm going to announce your appointment at that press conference. What press conference? This afternoon. 
Well, the problem is that it'll knock the crap out of the peace corps. I'm not taking you away from that. I'm just giving you a billion dollars more to work with. And uh, if you can't run a hundred million program in your left hand and a billion with your right hand, you're not as smart as I think you are. <laughs> I think he saw the perfect match between what Shriver had done on the Hill for the Peace Corps and what he could do with the war on, on, on poverty. But I am going to make it clear that you missed poverty. The home and abroad, you ought to be. <laughs> you got the responsibilities, you got the authority, you got the power, you got the money. Now, you may not have the glands. The glands? Yeah. I got plenty of glands. All right. Well, I have it. I guess he could have said no, but one didn't say no to Lyndon Johnson, you know? He just didn't. Sarge told Eunice, I don't really want to run this thing. And I'm going to call the president back and tell him that. How long do you think you want me to do this? As long as you want to. Uh, you know, the Peace Corps has been a non-political thing. I, I think this will be quite political. I don't. You just go ahead now. Brace yourself. Let's go. You ready? Well, I, I'm, um, I'm still hoping that you won't. Let <laughs> me put it that way. Okay. I conferred at length with Sergeant Shriver, and I have asked him to serve as special assistant to the president in the organization and the administration of the War on Poverty program, which I announced in my State of the Union message. Mr. Shriver will begin immediately to study the causes and cures of poverty in the United States. In 1964, 30 million Americans lived in poverty. Although most of the poor were white, the power of the civil rights movement raised the issue to a place on the national agenda and stirred the new president to action. Can you help us free these Americans from the prison of poverty? And if you can, let me hear your voices. As a young man, Johnson had taught Mexican-American children in rural Texas. Later, as a congressman, he idolized Franklin Roosevelt and dreamed of completing the New Deal. He named his vision for a better America, the Great Society. It included civil rights, voting rights, support for the arts, medical care to the elderly, and help for the poor. Lyndon Johnson was a master at moving legislation through Congress but he had no blueprint for ending poverty. For that, he looked to Shriver. If a general was asked, you know, I want you to launch war on Grenada, could you invade it and take it over? Well, you know, that's something you can get your mind around. But a war on poverty, that's like saying, could you, uh, in Frontin's purpose, could you wage war on gravity? He thought, oh my God, how am I gonna do this? He began by ordering research. And then he went looking for what the author Michael Harrington called the other America, the invisible poor. In Appalachia, Shriver saw schools that were shacks and heard stories of children eating dirt from the inside of stovepipes. In the Deep South, he witnessed the rule of Jim Crow, whereby black children were kept out of school to pick cotton, while their parents faced violence if they attempted to vote. In the North, most blacks were confined to ghettos, cut off from good schools, housing, and jobs. When Shriver saw the research he ordered, he was stunned. Of all the nation's poor people, half were children. He became very, very committed to the point where this was no longer just a, a political assignment or something he needed to do because the president asked him, but this was something that had to be done and done right, and he became very passionate about it. People are interested in being treated as human beings. They're interested in having other people treat them, as the, as the Declaration of Independence says, as equals. That's the first thing that's needed in the war against poverty. 
the civil rights movement had really elevated the notion of equality, and he wants to extend that spirit now to programs to end poverty nationwide. You have to have that sense of human respect and dignity and equality before these other specific programs, like a health program or an educational program, can have its maximum effect. Mr. Shriver, you say that you hope that something... Shriver called up anyone who knew anything about poverty. Activists, scholars, the priests and nuns who worked among the poor, and the reporters who wrote about them. In 16 weeks, they had a plan. It's not a program of federal handouts to alleviate poverty temporarily. It is aid to help those who are willing to help themselves get out of poverty by building up their skills, increasing their employability. Shriver hated the idea of handouts, which he equated with what he called cheap grace, a kind of a charity which does not empower people. The plan created OEO, the Office of Economic Opportunity. As in the Peace Corps, he wanted the poor to lift themselves out of poverty, and he wanted privileged Americans to work among them. OEO launched VISTA, Head Start, Youth Corps, Job Corps, Upward Bound, Foster Grandparents, Work Study, and a way to give poor communities resources for their own anti-poverty programs called Community Action. Community Action, as its name implies, is local action. We depend completely on local communities to come to Washington with their own programs of combating poverty in the ways that they see fit to do it in their own hometown. Everybody's talking about our country's problems. Why not do something about them? The name of the game is VISTA. Volunteers in service... Shriver returned to the college campuses and urged students and teachers to practice what he called the politics of service. Not by more courses and responsibility, not by lectures, not by commencement speeches but by political action in this true sense of politics in the service of your city. It mobilizes a tremendous cohort, particularly of young Americans, who are now being challenged in a way which they felt they had not been challenged before. It was a time in history when it was clear that it's the right thing to do and you could do it. Just do it. Everybody get involved and do what you can do. Within a year, OEO announced that the war on poverty had reached three million people. Newsweek wrote, the poor were no longer invisible. As of today, 1,000 American communities have organized themselves into community action groups. The newly formed groups met in churches and community centers, making plans to improve life in their city neighborhoods and small towns. And the water should be on. It was the first time poor communities had authority and federal money to tackle problems where they lived. I think that this is a problem that this group should be actively involved in. And they use the influx of federal money to tackle problems like transportation, like child development, like education, like health care, like slum conditions. Shriver reasoned that for the poor to have some control over decisions affecting their lives, OEO needed to fund community action groups independent of City Hall, even though he knew that would anger local politicians. And it did. And they said, what the hell is Shriver doing? Big city mayors were outraged by community action, and they argued, we're the duly elected representatives of the people. In Newark, Los Angeles, Cleveland, Chicago, action groups carried out rent strikes against slum landlords and protested government policies that maintain segregation. They charged mayors with neglecting their schools and city services and accused them of favoring more affluent communities. Inside the war on poverty, Battles erupted in communities across the country in a struggle for power. From the perspective of the activists themselves, it's a stepping stone for them to get their issues heard and to finally get the city to pay attention and do something about their problems. 
And sometimes that means they're on a collision course with big city mayors. And so for the mayors, it looks like the federal money is helping these rabble rousers make trouble. All they had to do was pick up a telephone dial a number and say, we are still working on it. Shriver met with the nation's mayors to try to ease tensions. We're not trying to exclude mayors, he said, but we want to bring everyone in. Let's all of us have enough of the spirit of our country and enough compassion to unbar the door to all who are poor. But few mayors were moved. And by joining in his together, defense, Shriver told Congress that the war on poverty was not just to help poor people change but that hostile or uncaring institutions also had to change, especially government. A year into the war on poverty, Shriver found another way to make that happen. When he found himself politically blocked, what more natural thing would there be but to turn to the law and to see if the law could be made an ally to the poor? The poor need and deserve the same quality of legal services that the profession owes to all citizens. He makes an incredible speech, and he pulls the ABA into the Community Action Program through legal services to the poor. In January of 1966, Shriver opened neighborhood law offices across the country. We will be representing the poor people. We will continue to accept cases. And we'll Along comes this little pipsqueak lawyer program that says, if you keep doing things the way you have been doing, like discriminating against folks who are black or folks uh, who are Hispanic or kids who have arrest records as juveniles, uh, we're just going to have to sue you. They sued school boards and city governments for discrimination and employers for unfair labor practices. He had Ronald Reagan, amongst other folks, call him up and say, hey, what are your lawyers out in California doing this? They're suing the Department of Labor. That's me. You're giving them money to sue me. What's going on here? They were talking about inequality. And all of a sudden, uh, these state commissioners get dragged into a courtroom, the superintendent of schools, the mayor. Leaders of both parties complained that legal services and community action were a bunch of Boston Tea Parties. And they were dumbfounded. Shriver dared to give federal money to the poor to sue local governments. He bought into a mess of trouble uh, and stood by it. He was putting his personal capital on the line for this. All the credibility that he had bought with the Peace Corps, all of the credibility of a Kennedy family connection and his own reputation as somebody from the private sector who'd been successful. We expect action at the community level. And when you've got action, you've got arguments, you've got dissent, you've got differences of opinion. That's what we're financing. For the first time in the history of this country, poor people actually have a place and a way in which to express themselves. So that's community action. Anybody thinks that is an action, misplaces or misinterprets the situation, they think community action must mean community apathy or community torpor or community death. We're creating life at the community level. When you got life, you got movement, you got dissension, you got action. That's what we want. Congressman Powell says something. Shriver pushed and pleaded with local officials to move over and share power with those who are to be helped. But it can't be token involvement, he said. It must be real. That question of whether or not the solution to the problems of the country and society involve a partnership of all people or simply involve the workings of those people who are already established leaders. That's the central controversy. And I think that how so many people come on the other side of the issue than Shriver does tells us that for many people the question was not solving poverty but maintaining power. By the summer of 1966, America had become deeply polarized. Riots erupted in the black ghettos of the nation's cities, sending shockwaves across the country. Government reports attributed the riots to a lack of jobs, poor schools, and feelings of isolation from the larger society. Twice, Shriver pressed Johnson for a six-fold increase in his anti-poverty budget. 
He said, if you want to wage a war on poverty, this is how you do it. Johnson rebuffed both appeals. He needed the money for another war in Vietnam. Growing divisions between black and white, young and old, hawks and doves threatened the great society and strained Shriver's relationship with the president. Privately, Johnson complained that Shriver had started a damn revolution. The war on poverty was embattled on all fronts. And a struggle for power in the Deep South was about to imperil the entire effort. Mississippi was virtually a slavery system where people worked all year, lived um, and bought their food from the plantation owner and at the end of the year found that they owed him money. It was America, South Africa, let's put it that way. It was a system of total, rigid, racial and economic apartheid. Shriver took a personal interest in the state. He sent OEO staff to help launch the Child Development Group of Mississippi, CDGM. Is that the same as this? Yay! Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was considered a model Head Start program. Volunteers built playgrounds and turned unused shacks into schools. Parents trained to become teachers. 6,000 children from the Mississippi Delta were enrolled. For most of the children, it was the first time they played with toys, ate a nutritious meal, or saw a doctor. It was a revolution in many ways, both economically and for the parents and the vision of themselves and, and the hopes that their children could be different than they. Because when you start telling little five-year-old children that they're equal to little five-year-old white kids, they grow up believing that. And then they become what this state calls uppity niggas. And you know they don't like that. And they didn't. This democratic sponsored federal money exacted from you and me in taxes is financing the operation of an anti-white cell down at Mount Beulah near Edwards. White Mount opponents terrorized the program. Schools were destroyed by arson. Classroom walls riddled with bullets. Local police refused to investigate. Instead, U.S. Senator John Stennis investigated the Head Start program. We found that one salaried employee actually was in Washington taking part in civil rights marches while drawing a salary in Mississippi. Stennis we wielded national power on the Senate committee that controlled funding for the war on poverty. He summoned Shriver to testify. The truth, the whole truth, so help you God. I do. Stennis had proof that CDGM had used funds for teachers to pay civil rights workers. He wanted Shriver to shut the program down. Well, I, I bet I was disappointed, sir, that you didn't move. They call you a man of action. You're a man of action. Senator Stennis attacked this program immediately because he did not want black folk controlling significant amounts of money. He didn't want black children and parents thinking differently. I mean, he saw the revolution that it was. And I think it's significant that of all the charges we've heard about this program, no, nobody has yet contested the quality of the program, the content, its results, or the meaning of this program to the parents and the children of the poor people who are involved. We asked to sit down with Senator Stennis, and he had this wonderful southern accent, and he probably thought I had a god-awful New England Yankee twang. And he said, Sarge, Edgar, I know what you're trying to do here in Mississippi, but I've got to tell you, you are never going to have Negro children going to school with white children in the state of Mississippi. When Shriver refused to close down the program, Stennis turned to the president. The president then turned to Shriver. 
the President of the United States is saying to him, you know, look, we can't crush the whole war on poverty or head start nationwide because of this one program. You got to do something with it. Senator Stennis is powerful. He's leaning on me. You have got to do something about this program in Mississippi. I don't care how good it is. Sergeant Shriver was caught in a terrible vice, a terrible position. He didn't want to cut off something that represented the best of the best of what he could imagine Head Start would be. Shriver cut a deal with Stennis that kept classrooms open. But he fired the program's top leaders and replaced them with others more acceptable to the senator. I think there were a significant number of people who thought it was a victory for the segregationists. That's a judgment call. You know, would we have lost the war on poverty appropriation if we hadn't acted? Some of us believe the answer to that is yes. Others, I'm sure, would contradict that. But this was not the time to play Russian roulette. And if there isn't a political deal involved here, let them prove it. CBGM felt betrayed. Sergeant Schreiber himself a couple months ago said this was the best program in the nation and what we're going to have to ask him is how that changed all of a sudden. The problem that he was in a very difficult position. Too good. But we also learned that you there are no friends in politics that you've got to also organize and mobilize to protect children who have no constituency in the poor whom nobody cares about. And when I see all of these people, I know CDGM is not dead. The conflict intensified when labor and religious leaders confronted Shriver with a full-page ad in the New York Times. I don't remember who brought him a copy of the ad, but uh, it sent a clear message that we had sold out. This was a kind of baseball bat with a rusty nail in it, blow square on your body. He was caught between two constituencies. One was the political one here in Washington, which saw him as a fomenter. Oh, you're going among those poor people with community action, giving them, giving them a say in how government should work. And then he had the poor people who were, who were his constituency, and they say he wasn't fomenting enough. It was hard for him to go out there and give a talk to the poor and be shouted down. And I don't apologize to anybody, anywhere, in or out of this room for the result of the war against poverty. This was a guy who, who had been blessed. Everywhere he had gone, everything he had done had turned into gold. Now everything he was doing, seeming, was turning to political garbage. And then, there was Vietnam. In 1966 and 1967, LBJ decides to deepen the United States' involvement in the Vietnam War. What this means for him is he's going to have to make a choice. Am I going to sustain the war on poverty, or am I going to fund the Vietnam War? And he chooses the Vietnam War. Vietnam just must be the center of our concern. Johnson saw Vietnam as a Cold War battle to contain the spread of communism in Southeast Asia. Advisors insisted that the war would be short. But America's commitment in troops and money only grew. The war on poverty was now competing with the war in Vietnam.
because the Vietnam War meant that Johnson would increasingly siphon funds originally earmarked for OEO to the war in Vietnam. And that was deeply disturbing to Shriver and so many others who would help create these programs. And that was a fact of life. And there was nothing they could do about it. And there was nothing they could do to persuade Johnson otherwise. In the spring of 1967, Shriver took OEO's budget request to Congress. But this time, without the full backing of the president. He asked lawmakers to consider OEO's progress 500,000 teens in youth corps, 4,000 VISTA volunteers, new neighborhood health clinics, 10 million families lifted above the poverty line. But Congress wasn't interested. This war in Vietnam very properly has top priority and first call upon our military manpower and other assets. Certainly it has the topmost priority with me, and I feel major elements of the great society, including the poverty program, should be relegated to the rear depending this emergency. When Congress left for its summer recess, it allowed OEO's funding to lapse. Shriver was forced to cancel programs. If he couldn't secure funding in the fall, the war on poverty would starve to death. I think it would be a gross deception to delude the American people that something substantial is being done about problems here at home, such as lack of education, lack of health, lack of justice, lack of housing, lack of opportunity, to delude them that something is being done about that when you appropriate so little money that you can't do anything substantial about it. How can anybody in their right mind decide that it is an intelligent expenditure of your dollar to put 75 cents into military wars and drop out a cent and a quarter to solve the problems of the poor here at home. That doesn't make any sense at all. If this program is funded at a level that you don't think can do the job, will you go on running it? No. The temptation to walk away uh, just go back to the Peace Corps, go back into private life, go back to Illinois, it must have been overwhelming. And he did think very seriously about it and actually submitted resignation notices a number of times and had to be talked out of uh, resigning. But in the end, he always felt, you know, who's going to protect these programs if I don't? You know, they, they, because they're so politically embattled, they need a champion, someone who's willing to stand by them and, and take the political flack. If not me, then who? By the time Congress returned in the fall, Communities across the country felt Shriver's budget cuts. They are part of a massive lobbying effort spurred by the effects of recent program cuts and these sudden realizations... The tide the began to turn, and 21 Republican mayors signed a letter pleading with Congress to restore funding. I hope that we can begin to forget about whether we can afford guns and butter and come to the realization that what we're involved in in a war against poverty is not butter at all, but life itself. Well, I certainly hope you're right. Shriver personally testified for 41 hours. One congressman joked, like the poor, we have Shriver always with us. It's fundamental. It's subsistence. It's basic. It's not in any way a superficial type. The OEO bill was retrieved from defeat. Vista, Head Start, Legal Services, all the anti-poverty programs were saved. But for Shriver, victory was bittersweet. He came to the conclusion that he had done all he could and could no longer stay on. Sarge won a crucial budget fight, but he knew that the bigger battle, which was to get the $10 billion investment, to, to get the ever-increasing investment until you really licked poverty, um, he began to see that that wasn't going to happen. Later in life, Trevor said, Vietnam took it all away. Every goddamn dollar. On December 23, 1967, President Johnson boarded Air Force One. He was handed the OEO bill for his signature. But this time, there was no White House ceremony. Johnson signed the anti-poverty bill on his way to Vietnam.
later in life, Johnson said, the great society was the woman that I loved, and that bitch of a war took her away from me. By 1968, riots in American cities, white backlash, and protests over Vietnam had weakened Johnson's leadership. Arguments with Shriver over funds for OEO seeped out to the press and widened the rift between them. Weary of the fight, Shriver started thinking about returning to Chicago to run for the Senate. Then Johnson offered Shriver the ambassadorship to France. Shriver said, He'd think about it. By the time Shriver actually was offered the position of ambassador to France, uh, he was very burned out as head of the war on poverty. I mean, here for, you know, for the last eight years, he'd been in two administrations running two huge programs and had been just absolutely embattled during the last three or four years of the war on poverty. And he was ready for anything different that would get him out of the Johnson administration in Washington. Nineteen sixty-eight has been described as the darkest and most turbulent political year in American history. In January, North Vietnamese offensive belied Johnson's claims that the U.S. was winning the war. On March 31st, a dispirited president announced that he would not run for re-election. Four days later, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Shriver watched flames from his office window as riots erupted in the ghettos of Washington and a hundred U.S. cities. Eight weeks later, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. We are all uh, shocked and deeply uh, disturbed by this uh, act of violence. And, uh... A funeral train carried Bobby Kennedy's body from New York to Washington for burial alongside his brother Jack. One witness said, coming after the King assassination, yet another shred of hope has been wrenched from the land. I, Sergeant Shriver, Jr., of Illinois. To A month swear, before Bobby's death, Shriver had accepted Johnson's Sergeant offer to become the ambassador to France. I go out on this task to carry on the work which we tried to epitomize in the Peace Corps. And I emphasize the word peace. He welcomed the opportunity to be in Paris for the peace talks to try to end the war. That summer, Vietnam was also the focus of attention in Chicago at the Democratic National Convention. Demonstrators descended upon the city, demanding an end to the war. A police riot ensued. Above the clash, the Democratic nominee for president, Hubert Humphrey, was deciding on a running mate. He wanted the youngest of the Kennedy brothers, but Ted Kennedy declined, too grief-stricken to run. Rumor had it that Shriver was Humphrey's next choice. Even after the difficulties he had with the war on poverty, he was still one of the most popular political figures among youth in particular, and also would do well among Catholic groups. So there were a lot of good electoral reasons and personal reasons and substantive reasons for Humphrey to want to pick Shriver. Humphrey has not yet tipped his hand as to his final choice, but as we reported here about two weeks ago, if he does choose Shriver, Shriver will accept. Polls showed Shriver to be the strongest candidate, and Chicago's papers reported his selection as imminent. In Paris, Shriver listened to the radio reports from Chicago, describing police attacking demonstrators. He prepared an acceptance speech that reached out to the protesters. He wants to steer Humphrey in the direction of espousing peace very explicitly, 
Shriver knows that peace is possible because the peace delegation briefs him virtually every evening on the events of that day. In his embassy office, Shriver awaited word from Humphrey. He, in fact, had a reservation on every plane that could get him from Paris to Chicago in time to make his acceptance speech. So he was ready to go, absolutely ready to go. Meanwhile, in Chicago, Humphrey was meeting with delegates and considering his choice for vice president. As the convention began and Humphrey was deliberating, certain members of the Kennedy family, and more than that, people connected with the Kennedy family, in effect intervened and said, no, uh, if, if Shriver's on the ticket, uh, you risk Hubert Humphrey, you risk losing uh, the support of the Kennedy family. Whether that was true or not, it's hard to say, but the threat was real. Shriver was willing and able, but the Kennedy clan was opposed. The Kennedyites were alarmed at the prospect of a popular Shriver standing in the way of Ted Kennedy four years from now. Basically, it's the kind of reaction that Lyndon Johnson got four years before that the family has a line of succession, and it's the direct line, it's not the son-in-law's line. In a letter to a friend, Trevor wrote, the same clique who opposed the Peace Corps as an independent agency, the palace guard now without a palace, find it hard to accept the prospect of a prodigal in-law sitting down to their feast. The palace guard now without a palace. That's a powerful phrase. That's the only time I have ever heard him express any feeling, any negative feeling about the price he had paid in personal terms for becoming a son-in-law rather than being a person in his own right. Later, Shriver was more philosophical. He said, in politics, when men are playing for such stakes, you can't count on personal ties and shouldn't take these things personally. Humphrey chose a senator from Maine for his running mate, and he ignored Shriver's advice, instead criticizing the protesters and rejecting the peace platform of the convention. In the fall, he lost to Richard Nixon by one of the smallest margins in American history. It marked the end of a political era. At the dawn of the next decade, the hope and idealism of the early 1960s had given way to a national mood of discontent and distrust. Shriver talked about the whole atmosphere of the country weighing heavily on him. He said the expanding war in Southeast Asia and the Kent State Massacre affected him more deeply than any other political events in life. Americans have been numbed by years of useless war. But the war is not our only sickness. The best fed nation of the world suffers from a famine of the spirit. We have a sense of something missing. Something In 1972, Shriver was offered the chance to run for vice president on the national democratic ticket with Senator George McGovern. A people with transcendent goals. McGovern's first pick was forced to withdraw. Others who were asked to run refused. The campaign was in disarray and McGovern trailed badly in the polls. Still, Shriver welcomed the fight. We intend to go out and ask of our young people not just to protest against inadequate schools, but to teach children. Not just to talk about love, but to work with the retarded and the elderly and the lonely and the ill and the blind and the millions of hungry children around the world. At each stop, we knew we would get our heads handed to us, recalled a campaign aide. 
and this is what it will be again. But it was almost as though Sarge thought if he could just talk to everyone, he could somehow turn it around. He couldn't. Richard Nixon was re-elected, this time in a landslide. Four years later, Shriver made one more run for national office in the Democratic presidential primaries. His campaign never caught on, and he withdrew. By 1976, Shriver seemed really out of step with the times. In the aftermath of Watergate and the Vietnam War, there was a tremendous loss of faith in the political process and a real cynicism about public service. And Shriver embodied this kind of buoyant optimism, which seemed out of style because it seemed unrealistic. Maybe he was, would have been miscast as a politician, but he, he didn't quite have really a lust for power. And he, he sort of had it, but it was more instrumental in his case. For him, it was more motivated by faith or by his idealistic vision of trying to make the world a better place. And in the end, he, he may not have had the cutthroat edge that you need in order to be a really effective uh, electoral politician. There are no easy answers, but America cannot even begin the return to our traditions of humanity until we understand what peace really means and are prepared to earn it. In his later years, Shriver pursued ways to build world peace. During a surge in Cold War tensions, he guided the pastoral letter that placed the weight of America's Catholic Church against the escalation of the nuclear arms race. And in 1986, he joined Eunice at Special Olympics to become its president. In doing Special Olympics International and bringing it to all these foreign countries, it's very much in the spirit of the Peace Corps uh, and, and trying to bring people together across national, cultural, ethnic boundaries of the differences that separate us. Just like all the programs he created, was that you break down these hierarchies that seem to separate people from each other in some fundamental way, and you create genuine interaction based on recognition of a common humanity that you see in others. At some deep level, it's really about freeing human beings who are suffering injustices that they should never have to be suffering under, whether it's poverty or political oppression. From 1964 to 1968, nearly one out of every three poor Americans left the poverty rolls. It was the largest four-year drop ever recorded. Historians agree the war on poverty played a role, but to what extent is hard to measure. Johnson didn't complete his vision for a great society. And Shriver didn't end poverty. Still, the Americans who reached for those goals advanced the promise of democracy and altered the nation's history as in no other era since the Civil War. Community action provided political training and pathways into public office and other positions of power for tens of thousands of blacks and Latinos. Head Start revolutionized early childhood education. 23 million children have benefited and thousands of women have used Head Start teaching as a pathway to enter the workforce. Legal services invented the practice of poverty law. Its lawyers won hundreds of cases before the Supreme Court that advanced opportunities for the poor nationwide. And since 1961, nearly 200,000 Peace Corps volunteers have served around the world. How do we get people to credit the idea that everyone needs to make a contribution to the problems of society? Everyone has something to do in the way of service in relation to other people. Schreiber was a leading philosopher of that kind of approach in the sense that others may have written more eruditely, more learnedly, more convincingly about these. But Shriver, as much if not more than anybody else, put them into practice, gave them institutional substance, set them at the center of government policy in the most powerful nation in the world. In June of 2003, Sergeant Shriver was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. 
In a letter to family and friends, he wrote, If names are slow to come to me, please forgive me. But if at any moment I seem content with things as they are, don't leave the room. Remind me of the great times we've had and the great work waiting to be done. I'm sure I'll be eager to rise to face new challenges, whatever they may be. We're talking about outlandish dreams, about unrealistic expectations. Whether it's Sarge Shriver saying, no, 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 we're not going to have 50,000 children at start this summer, we're going to have half a million. That's vintage Sergeant Shriver. Optimism, hope. Now you can denigrate that. You can deride it. You can be cynical. But look around. That same spirit, that same need for the human being to do something larger, to prove their humanity, that same need exists today. That's why I have hope. Mr. Schreiber, do you really believe that poverty can be wiped out? Yes, I do. This program is made possible in part by the Essilor Vision Foundation. In the U.S., one in four children has an uncorrected vision problem. That can affect school performance and behavior. As a teacher, I urge you to have your child's eyes examined. And is also made possible by 